Afternoon, evening, whatever time you're tuning in the program called What's Going On on FlintTalkRadio.com. I'm George Moss, the host of the program, and we come to you live at 2 o'clock on Mondays from 2 to 3. And we are here, rain, shine, sleet, or snow, and none of those are happening today, so there's no excuse. <laughs> it's not raining, but the sun is not out either. But we're going to be here regardless, unless there's um, snow outside and we can't get the we can't get the services that we need in the city. <laughs> get the uh, streets uh, shovel. But other than that, you can expect us here at 2 o'clock. We'll expect you to be there as well. And um, don't forget to tell your friends about what we do here at FlintTalkRadio.com and all of the programs here at the studio. And I uh, want you to uh, tune in all the programs here because we are working hard to win your trust. And uh, I can't say that for all of the media, by the way, because I'm going to be talking about some of them this afternoon. And, and then some of them have done a good job, too, and I'm going to mention, mention that as well. But uh, there are some characters out there, and we've got to be on the lookout for those persons be able to ferret them out <clears throat> so they can't get away with the malfeasance that they're doing in the uh, responsible offices they have coming before the, before the uh, public and doing what I'm sure Bill O'Reilly would say is bloviating, <clears throat> a term that I heard for the first time on this program, and this, in the no-spin zone, and I think there's a no-spend zone as long as nobody else is, is um, spending except him. But there are some times when he's not spending, and, and what I want to talk about today, uh, some things he's doing in which he's not spending, he's in fact telling the absolute truth and being brutally honest in some of the assessments he made about what has happened around the Trayvon Martin case, which we seem not to be able to get off because it seems like every um, chance we get, something else comes out, just as we think that the, that the the, uh, the, 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 the senders are, uh, you know, dying out and the last, um, you know, uh, coals in the fireplace are uh, dying out and receding. Then something else hits the, um, the, the, the news and this uh, story continu continues to uh, reverberate around in the media that does not want to let go of this uh, story they've had for the last 18 months. And I think that tells us a lot, too, as a matter of fact, <clears throat> as what that means. And that is, if they had anything else to go to, you know, if there was as much of a pervasiveness of the racism that we keep looking for and we fly to when we find, we think we found it, if that was as pervasive as they say it is, then we would not have to, in fact, beat a dead horse uh, to death again and keep on uh, beating him and wake him back up and beat him again if there was something else to, uh, to, in fact, go to. And the things we can go to that's happening more regularly is that which we refuse to report on. And that's according to the FBI statistics and what I know <clears throat> is happening outside of the purview of the press that won't cover the other side. I mean, it's like, you know, Paul Harvey, page two. We stay on page one, uh, <laughs> which we never get around to page two. But page two is significant also. Uh, in fact, more significant. Because that which is not being reported gives us a false idea of what really is going on on the political and racial landscape in this country. And we get a very scared view of what really is taking place in the United States, which makes people believe that blacks are under siege in this country. And there's nothing further from the truth uh, today. And when I say that, I know most of you out there, not, not in our listenership, because we have a, a much more assertive and a much more informed leadership, uh, viewership. But a lot of people, when you start talking about racial politics, they want to talk about 1913. Well, and I want to talk about 100 years later. Can we, go, can we get to the present time period and talk about what is happening right now? Not 100 years ago, but what's happening in the environment at this point in time and who's driving this racial narrative. It's not the same condition as it was when we uh, had uh, the help, you know, which is a film we talked about last week that's made about those uh, domestics, those, um, <clears throat> I like to call them um, household engineers that were working in these uh, homes in the South and of which a picture was made, a, a movie was made of it that uh, showed the tremendous um, <clears throat> jobs that these uh, women had in white households in the South which showed that blacks were in the homes of whites in the South when it was supposed to be at its most rigorous levels of, um, of white supremacy in the, uh, in the environment. I want somebody to explain that to me, 
how can the Southern culture be so situated with racism and it can be so pervasive and yet there are blacks being carried to work in uh, cars driven by whites. I mean, they, I mean, blacks sitting in the back seat and you thought driving Miss Daisy was, was, uh, was bad. Uh, they, these blacks uh, riding in the back seat and uh, in most cases uh, you would uh, see that as empowerment because the guy sitting in front, he's not in charge. I mean, where well, you sit when you get in the taxi? You sit, do you, <laughs> do you ride in the front seat? And John, when, when, they were riding, when, when you ride in the taxi, uh, you ride in, in the back, don't you? Yeah, and, yeah, yeah. And, that, and that's where the power seat is because that's the person paying the fare. Those, those black uh, maids that were picked up in the South, don't forget now, this is where the pervasive racism was supposed to be. And those black people are riding in the power seats in the back of the cars, and they're picking them up with their gas and carrying them to the jobs that they're working in in these homes and uh, because that's the kind of uh, need that was there for those uh, domestic engineers wh whom we call maids and we don't see some of the empowerment things that were happening in that relationship which seemed like the blacks didn't have any power but I'm trying to give you another way of looking at it because I don't think that we understand uh, the history uh, in this country, in particular, as it relates to the uh, the racial politics of this country, that we are, are not really appreciating the fact that this country, with all of its warts, with all of its pimples, uh, still has less to answer for than any other country in the world, and that's just a fact. Not what's about to prove me wrong on that, uh, uh, particularly on my on my Facebook wall. Anyway, I came to the studio today, and I wanted to talk about. Uh, several things. I was saying that as soon as I think I can go on to another topic and <laughs> and deal with uh, something else, because a lot of things you know we want to uh, talk about, and I think we have to you know move on. And then something else comes up to keep me uh, stuck on the same um, not the not the same points, but the same you know issue. And until we get past this, we're going to have to continue to try to bring some light to what is a very dark um, painting of a situation where there's almost no clarity being brought to bear by the uh, news media. Let me just t let me uh, mention that in terms of what uh, I just happened to have come across this morning. I wrote an article this morning, and the article was on, uh, you know, it was on um, juror number uh, uh, B29. It's like we're playing bingo. Uh, uh, B37 came out first. And B-29 wasn't uh, called, and so B-29 comes out. I mean, after, you know, there were six jurors. I think there's six lines down. I forget how I many <laughs> lines it is on the bingo. But everybody is B or C. I think, I think everybody is B something. B-37 B came out first. Now we got B-29 coming out. And uh, when we get the other four to come out, I think we're going to have bingo at that point, you know, either diagonal or, you know, horizontally, uh, you know, vertical. Or, you know, maybe... Uh, uh, you know, how was a uh, 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 diagonal, but uh, B twenty nine came out, and uh, they had this uh, they had this interview with uh, Juror uh, B twenty nine, and her 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 interview was on Good Morning America, and I knew it was not going to go well when I saw the interview of being uh, uh, Robin uh, Givens. <laughs> I mean, I can't tell who's the worst. You know, Robin Givens, uh, George Stephanopoulos. But <laughs> Robin Givens, the one that used to be married to Mike Tyson? Uh, 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 what's her name? Not Robin Givens, but uh, no, her name is Robin. What's uh, her last name, Robin? I don't know. I, I, didn't, I don't watch those. No, it's not, it's not uh, Mike Tyson's uh, X. Yeah. Um, X. Uh, but I think, her name is, um, I think her name was Robin Givens, wasn't it? So this is another Robin. Robin, I don't. Somebody call and tell us what the last name is. Cause you know what? What show I, was that on? Uh, Good Morning America. Okay. Well, yeah. And uh, the reason why I wouldn't know it too well is because I try not to watch it unless it has something that's actually riveting, where there's an exclusive. Because I can't hardly watch these programs with all of the propaganda that they're actually uh, uh, emoting and and propagating. It's just so much out there that they say that's away from any kind of uh, evidence, and it's just. A propaganda machine, uh, and ABC is bad at it. But there's nobody can be any worse at it than MSNBC. That's called by Mark Levine, one of the smartest men in the media, 
Uh, cool. Robert Roberts. Ro Robert uh, there Roberts. you go. I'm glad you made the correction because that's exactly the name. Yeah, you know, I'm calling her Robin Givens. You know, they all, they, all these parents sound sound like to me, and and so I'm, I'm getting names mixed up because I can't tell if I'm listening to what they're talking about rather than listening to, to the voice quality. Uh, I can't, and, and also the physicality. I can't tell one from the other. They all sound the same way, and uh, then and so anyway, Robin Robin Roberts. I'm glad John is here to make the correction because if I get it wrong <clears throat> at FlintTalkRadio.com, we're going to get a correction here in the studio. And uh, John is not just behind the controls actually running things. I sit in front of the camera taking all the credit. <clears throat> but the ones behind the scenes here, there's got about 50,000 cameras in here, and I have to keep looking around which one is on now. <laughs> we got so many cameras in here. But I, and I see two of them on right now, so I think I'm on the one here. But um, if I get it wrong... You can believe that we're going to check the facts because we don't want to get it wrong here at the studio. We want to be right and try to bring the truth here. This is not a propaganda machine. We don't, we don't even uh, involve ourselves in our propaganda. We try to uh, be as straight as we can. We are as straight as an arrow here at FlintTalkRadio.com. And that's just not this program that comes on at 2 o'clock. There's all the programs that we do here at this uh, studio, <clears throat> Flint's number one podcast program studio in the uh, country. Uh, in the in the in the city, in Genesee County, and in the state, and we intend to keep it that way because, uh, you know, honesty is our uh, middle name. Well, my mom wouldn't think so, but uh, we try to be honest here. And in the um, given in the Roberts Robin Roberts, Robin Givens is the uh, person that uh, could not understand that. You can't go in there and uh, get beat up uh, by, by Mike Tyson. And I went in there and, and thought she could um, um, change the uh, par paradigm in this man's uh, life. I do understand he made a turnaround now, and he has his, his uh, program on, 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 on Broadway. He has his, his story on Broadway, probably full of lies, written by his wife, to his, wife his current wife. <clears throat> but... Not Robin uh, Givens, Robin Roberts. Robin Roberts. And um, she did an interview on ABC last week with uh, juror number B29. And I knew before I watched it, having taped it, that there was going to be some kind of skewered um, propaganda piece that was done because uh, whenever you get it on those those networks that are that given what they did all those 18 months we were actually covering this this case much of it fabricated by the media that drew us to it because of a narration that was uh, fabricated and very little of what they were reporting was true <clears throat> I knew then we were in for trouble in watching the interview and true enough when I watched it I did see some of the uh, flagrant propaganda at work here and I'll give you a couple of examples of it <clears throat> um, uh, as we talk about what this juror actually said. But the headline was um, the juror, and they have an article in, in the journal saying the same thing. Uh, Zimmerman juror says, um, George Zimmerman got away with murder, but you can't get away from God. And so this was the piece of the, this was the centerpiece of the conversation that was held with, with Robin uh, Givens. And when you look at the actual information inside of the uh, video underneath the headline of it, which was this jury had some um, uh, short, uh, she had some reservations about the uh, verdict, uh, not based on the evidence. The evidence was, 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 she never had a problem with the evidence. What her problem was, and of course Robin, Robin, Robin Roberts didn't want to bring this out, was that she really was, was wanted to dismiss the evidence and then make the conclusion based upon her own uh, prejudice. But uh, after going through that, and let me just read uh, something that, that summarizes it uh, here in the uh, Flint Journal that summarizes what this juror actually said. Uh, juror B-29 told Robin Roberts, she favored convicting Zimmerman of second degree, second degree murder <clears throat> when deliberations began by the six member all women jury. Quote, I was the juror that was going to give them 
a hung jury when she couldn't get the other five to go along with her flouting the, uh, the evidence. She says, I was a jury that was going to give them a hung jury. Uh, I fought to the end. In other words, be in that room where five people have come to recognize the evidence in this case. And, I, and anyone that watched this case, as I did, see, I don't, I don't think, and I'm not, I'm not bragging here. I don't pretend to have to brag. I think that, you know, bragging is for those who, uh, you know, can't back it up. And uh, if you can back it up, you're not bragging, you're just, just re, uh, reporting a fact. <clears throat> I don't think that anyone in this country, <clears throat> you know, watched this case with more diligence and more integrity than I did. And you have to watch it with integrity where you're really interested in just letting the evidence lead you to the conclusion. You don't have any preconceived notions of, of what the evidence is before you hear it, but you're willing to listen to the evidence and then at the end of it you all right you make a conclusion. Um, and I made a conclusion at the, at the end of each day. I was asking after any, uh, after the each day's hearing, some of which I had to watch you know up until two o'clock in the morning because you know, they strung it out all day. And I have to tape it first. So I, have to, I don't have to run through the commercials. And uh, so I was up at 2 o'clock in the morning most of those uh, days. I was glad when weekend came. That way I can go to bed uh, on, on, in a timely manner. But I watched it every day. And uh, sometimes at 2 o'clock, 2.30 in the morning. And I was just, and sometimes playing it back, I, I, was, I was determined to know what the case was about, what the evidence was. And after, after every day's uh, showing of this uh, case, and I give HLN credit for having shown the entire trial, uh, pausing it and coming back to it. And I know that that's what they were doing because they would pick it up on the other end of the, of the, of the commercial and it would play back to where there were some words used before it took a break. And letting you know that it was picked up at that point and then going forward. And uh, I give them a lot of credit for, in fact, covering this trial. And I will tell you something. Um, watching that trial, I don't take a back seat to anybody in the country as far as what was the evidence in this case. I asked every day of this uh, trial, where's the beef? And I didn't see it uh, during uh, day one. I didn't see it during the 14th day when the trial was coming to a close and they were getting ready for the closing arguments. There was just no beef here. And, and I asked a question at the end as I did at the beginning. What is this trial being uh, placed in the court in the first place? And as bad as the prosecutors were concerned and they were bad but not all of it was about incompetence although that was part of it as well as well i mean i couldn't believe uh, bernie um della um um uh, uh Deand Deand um trianda Deanda, one of one of those two uh bernie bernie's his, his first name and uh that last part is either Deanda or trianda one of those one of those two names i forget now but uh, he was a leading uh, prosecutor in the case, uh, the one that uh, had more hair on his lip than he had on his head, <clears throat> and uh, nothing inside. <laughs> that's, that's my take of him. And then they had this other person up there, um, John Guy, who showed he didn't have any integrity, the one that got up there and tried to add a charge at the end of the trial after they had been blown away by the defense team. He comes in at the last minute at the midnight hour, Wilson Pickett would have been proud of him going to wait until the midnight hour and, he, and that wasn't even about a girlfriend and he's going to try to bring in at the, at the midnight hour the manslaughter charge and try to bring in another charge as well which was uh, child abuse because they knew they, they had gotten their clock clean. He had no integrity, John Guy and uh, then the other person by the name of uh, Mantell Charles Man I think it was um, uh, Charles Mantell or Robert Mantell um, that uh, these people had no integrity and they really should be and and this is my own view based upon what what occurred before the case even got into court and that is and that's that's also you uh um the state uh, uh, uh the state attorney um angela corey i got that name right uh angela corey uh, all four of you all should be disbarred for your role in it. and i know your role very well because I look not only at the trial on HLN, I look behind the trial to see what you were doing before you even got to court. And what you did in order to get the case in the court was a travesty. And I don't want a person to get too much carried away with uh, what uh, is being reported about there being a, uh, a, a, a indictment by um, a, a private 
um, uh, a, a grand juror, jury having uh, indicted uh, 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 Angela Corey because that's just um, 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 this, this um, media watch, this jury watch that's uh, uh, run by a person by the name of, of, of Clay, Clayman down there in Florida. And, and it's a citizens kind of group, but I, until it has the official um, stickler on it, so to speak, then it doesn't really have any official uh, status. And so I understand what he's doing, because he saw the malfeasance that I saw. But uh, there's not, not an indictment yet, but it should be. And there should be a disbarment as well, given what these persons did in that, in that trial. Because this person, because George Zimmerman was being framed by the state. And that's exactly what George Zimmerman's attorney was saying, uh, uh, who, whose name is uh, Don West, who was saying that he hoped that they never see again uh, what happened in this case happened to another person in this country. And I know exactly what he was talking about because they were getting ready to send this guy to uh, prison for 10 to 30 years because a state was acting politically and not legally. And that is unconscionable in this country. You know, this is almost a case right here. You know, if you actually educate the jury about what the real law is, because I don't know if you're aware of this, but last year a woman was convicted in the state of Michigan. She was in full compliance with the Michigan Medical Marijuana Law. But during they busted her for something. She was they were put the primary they were prosecuting for was possession of marijuana. They turn around and they, but they, during the course of the conversation during the uh, trial, they were told, the defense was told that they weren't supposed to mention that their Michigan had a medical marijuana law and she was in full compliance with <laughs> it. So it's almost a case right now. I'm hearing all this and it's like, this is a case for people to be better educated about what a jury is expected of a jury and the powers of the jury. Mm -hmm. Basically, though, the both prosecution and the defense now depend upon you being passive, ridiculously undereducated, and uh, willing to be led like sheep mm -hmm. to their conclusions. Uh, John, that's what they were counting on in this case, and I'm sure it happens in a lot of other cases as well. I mean, how many persons are in jail right now that are innocent? Uh, they're not all innocent. I've, I had a class out there in, in at the Lapeer. Everyone I, that's in my class, I had about 40 in that class. Everybody was innocent. And I told them, not, not, not everybody in here can be innocent now. Some of you uh, well, may well be, but I can't believe everybody in here didn't deserve to be thrown in the hoose gal, so don't come in with that. This is not what this class is about. We <laughs> come in with these excuses. But uh, you, it, it makes you wonder about, about the integrity of the legal system when you go in the, in the room and you are bloviating in there rather than looking at the evidence and then letting the conclusions uh, uh, that you are to draw uh, to, to be inferred from the evidence you're supposed to consider to find a person either innocent or guilty of the uh, charges. We can have a politicized um, a, a jury nor a prosecution team that's, uh, that's politicized and that's what we had in this case here. Uh, Robin Roberts here's what you did in that uh, interview with juror number uh, B29, this is not bingo uh, <laughs> that was uh, John, listen to this right here uh, uh, Robin Roberts after the juror was saying uh, that she felt bad for the parents because what she was really saying was because she was tied to having to look at the evidence. If she had been able to act upon her prejudice, then she would have um, given in at the very beginning to find some reason to convict uh, George Zimmer, but could not do it because the other five weren't buying it and they continued to come back to the evidence and they finally convinced her that we had to look at the evidence here. And that's why she came from, in from the after holding out. From the evidence i seen, and I didn't watch the trial as intently as you did, but, okay, George Zimmer should have not this, should have not done that. But aside from all the fact, what it ended up as, the reason why he killed Trayvon is because Trayvon was on top of him, hit him in the head, smashed his head against the cement. But basically, what I'm hearing from people, they're pissed off because they're sad that Zimmerman didn't die instead of Trayvon. That's what they're mad about. But, uh, and, they're, and, they're, and they also have to fabricate the uh, evidence in the case because if you look at the actual conflict, then that's all Trayvon. You know what? The only person that had any, that's had any integrity on the national stage, as far as I can see, and there may be others out there, I just haven't seen them. The ones I have seen have no integrity. And, but uh, the one that I was really impressed with, John, you have to go and look at this video on uh, YouTube. And you know what that is? Charles Barkley. Charles Barkley. I was going to bring that up. I, I was just amazed at what he said. I saw that clip. That man, you know, that guy, sometimes he's over the top. 
But when he, what he said about race in this country, where he was saying that, and some, it just kind of sit off the cuff. I mean, he, was, he had a certain point he was trying to make, but there were some things that came to his mind as he was talking. He said, and black people are, uh, some, and there are some black people that are racist too. You, you think about, when you talk about racism, you think you're only talking about whites. There are some blacks that are racist. And I thought that that was really, um, that showed tremendous integrity. Because we don't want to talk about that aspect. We want to just come, act like we're still back there in 1913. And there we are, 100 years beyond that point. It's now 2013. And you can be surprised when we start talking about race in 2013, we're talking about, because we're not talking about the claim, we're talking about the new Black Panther Party. Did you ever see the uh, old <laughs> Dave Chappelle um, a skit about, he was about where they drafted people into the into a different race, you know, like the Wayne Tang crowd, the ga gang was like, you know, clan was like pulled into their, their voted to be Chinese by the name, and then they also draft, Prince was a part, a part, you know, he was like, the white people wanted him, and well, it's like, it's kind of weird now, they kind of foisted uh, Zimmerman, who was obviously Hispanic from his appearance, <laughs> yeah, right. down into our camp, and we got to defend him, and it's like, you know, white guys are, and it's like, what, thing is, based upon the evidence, I don't care if that were reverse reversed, if that was a white white guy kid on top of a black man <laughs> slamming his head into the concrete, I would expect the black guy to want to protect himself. I tell you what I would see that <laughs> that's why I didn't buy this notion that, that Zimmerman had his gun out from the very beginning. You know what they started arguing in the, in the trial? Uh, this was uh, this was uh, 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 Bernie. I'm gonna call you Bernie. You may, can I can I call you Bernie? I mean first name uh, 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 Bernie Della Deandra what are you? Find, find out the last name, somebody out there. And uh, what, what he was saying was that why did he why did he follow Trayvon? Because he had a gun, <laughs> and that was a great equalizer. And he's going to eventually say that the gun was out at the very beginning. Well, you know, um, folks, you know, can we get real? If you have your gun out at the very beginning of an altercation, do you let the person slam your head into the sidewalk repeatedly, and then uh, break your nose? And put abrasions on both sides of your of your head, laceration in the back of your of your of your skull, and you have, you got that gun out, and you're going to simply call for help. Can can you tell me what side of a fool are we talking about here? No, the thing is too. If Zimmerman pulled his gun on oh uh, Trayvon, you know, to initially do like the inquiry, or, you know how cops will pull a gun on you. I've had that happen before in the street. A cop will pull a gun on you and hold it while they're asking you questions. Uh -huh. Well, if he was trying to play the cop and did that. Trayvon would be either insane or belligerent and beyond belief to try to take on a man who he knew he was fully armed mm -hmm. with the gun was pulled. That's right. And that's insane, too. Yeah, that's insane also. You see, they're, they're, they're not only uh, asking George Zimmerman, they're asking us to believe George Zimmerman is, is insane. They're asking us to believe that Trayvon Martin was insane. They attacks a man who has a gun out. Anybody know anybody like that? Uh, I think what we normally do, if a person is, is better armed than we are, even if we have a knife, I, you know what that is? That's that uh, run, run, run because he's got your gun and he's aiming at your head. You ever heard that song? And that's what I would do. That's what I think any sane person would do. And uh, nobody said these guys were insane, but yet we act like they're supposed to be crazy out there uh, that night. But no, the, what the prosecution was trying to do was simply inflame the jury around none evidence because they didn't have any case and that's what they're trying to do out there trying to prove a none case and send a person to jail that they knew they were framing and that's why uh, they should be that's that's why they should be disbarred all four of them you know they, i but my opinion of this is they knew they didn't have a case going into it. when i first heard this people were speculating i know i talked to people who are professional legal people you know lawyers this they don't have a case from what they heard at that point so I think what they did is they saw offer up sacrificial lambs. Now I'm going to suspect that either these guys are little total screw ups of the prosecutors, and the prosecution put them in charge of this case, you know, to get rid of them. Or there's going to be political uh, payola back down down the road a bit. Either they're sacrificial lambs, or they're going to get something greater, a greater reward down the road a bit. But basically, I don't think they had a case to begin with. They knew that, but the, because of political pressure, because of media pressure, they had to stage one. Yeah, and that's my opinion. They, they, you're exactly right, and they wanted uh, the political pressure came from those persons that were out there in the street. And the governor of the state, and I think he he's complicit. Uh, one of those persons out of the street, and that's why he, in fact, got rid of the um, the, the attorney general, pushed the, the attorney general over to the side, and then brought in uh, this woman, whom um, Alan Dirch, which of Harvard University, uh, who was the first one to come out of the blocks and began to look at this case back in 2012, and said, "This is a this is a miscarriage of justice." This is before anybody else was talking about it, and as I began to look at the case more closely, I said, "My goodness, I can't believe this is going on." 
uh, is, you know, is Florida, has Florida moved off the shores of the United States? Has it now gone 90, mi 90 miles uh, to the uh, south down to Cuba? Has it floated off the, the, the continent, the North American continent? Has it floated down into become one of the islands uh, and now become adjacent to Cuba with what was going on down there? Because this was a travesty. And uh, he was exactly right. And that's what uh, they were doing down there. And the governor, I think, is, in, is involved in it as well. That's why I don't know if the uh, disbarment will go anywhere because the governor of the state of Florida is complicit in terms of what he did. Look at what, he, what his role was as he, in fact, pushed the attorney general out of the case. Um, locally, what they did, this was the city manager in the uh, city of Sanford and the mayor, who pushed the police chief out of the way. So they got on the state level, people being moved and others put in their place. That's you, uh, 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 Angela Corey, and the three prosecutors putting you in the place and getting the police chief out of the way. And that, he was, he was uh, uh, pushed out by the mayor and the uh, city manager in a job he had been in for about a year, year and a half. And they then brought in the culprits, the ones who had political ambitions that would do what they were told and wanted to further their career by being involved in this travesty. Those guys should be placed, you know, we talk about this, Bob, and these guys should be arrested, what they tried to do there. Because the, fourth, because the Fifth Amendment, which gives us due process of law and ties the federal government to it, and then that is in fact extrapolated into the 14th Amendment, where now you're tying the states into that requirement, which is the 14th Amendment due process of law clause that's reiterated uh, in that particular uh, civil rights uh, uh, provision. Besides, if you want to look at it, if they want to hold true to, you always want to be true and consistent about federal law and federal law, or making things federal concern, then he, uh, Zimmer should have had a trial by 12, not 6, because that's what we're guaranteed in the Constitution, the Bill of Rights. And yeah. uh, states, uh, Michigan does it. We get away with you know, allowing you know, jurors of 6, juries of 6. That's a violation of the Bill of Rights, isn't well, it? Well, no, it's not a violation of civil rights. You can have a, a, what the Constitution calls for, and Justice Jackson, listen to this real carefully, because you didn't understand the, the requirement. You're talking about um, the jury made up of six women. None of them were black. Were not a, was not a jury of Trayvon Martin's peers. You, you know, can we uh, get you to just kind of you know shut up already? Because you're just making you know just just making uh, you're just gracing yourself every day. Every time you open your mouth, what the what, what the Constitution uh, calls for is that a person will be tried by a jury of his or her peers. And, because, and the reason why that is true is because if you're tried by a jury of the peers of the, um, the, of, the, of, the, of, of, the, of the person doing the filing, the plaintiff, in the case, you never get justice. If I can put my, if I can put my cousin on the, on the jury, I guarantee you, my mom, you know, my, my cousin, my auntie, because they all love me. So I know if I get into a case and they're on the jury, I know automatically you're going to get convicted. So it's not, it's not the, 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 the peers of the one bringing forth the charge is the ones that are defending. We have a jury of his peers. Tell me, it don't mean his cousins. It means that someone who is similarly situated. That is not to say that someone who understands the condition out of which the defendant comes so they can give some kind of evaluation based upon the evidence. It don't mean you're, you're partial. It means that you can be independent based upon having a circumstance out of which you can bring yourself to the evidence. And of course what they do before they get to the trial, they try to preempt those who are not able to be a jury of the peers. That's what they're doing. And they preempt those who are in the jury pool jury of his peers who have shown that they cannot be impartial. But it's like, isn't it kind of what the civil rights movement was all about? Is to expand what who is considered equal to each other. You know, the peers. You know, your your equals is going to be now. It's not just the white man's going to be better than you automatically. That you could the general population because your 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 station life has risen because your rights have been acknowledged and you can operate under that assumption. Then all those people out there are actually your peers. I mean, your equals. That's it's, what they're saying. That's what it's supposed to that's be. That's what it's supposed to be. Yeah, it's it's supposed to be that, John. And uh, whenever you get a jury of peers that cannot separate the prejudice they bring to it as a jury of the peers and the evidence, then you want to preempt them from being on the trial. You know, that's, and that's why I said earlier that uh, people didn't understand what Don West was doing in his opening statement when uh, Bernie, can I call you Bernie? Bernie was up there in the opening statement. And he was saying, um, it, no, it was John Gotti did this. He was up there uh, giving an opening statement. He was actually up there cursing, using the words that George Zimmerman uh, made under his breath to the 911 call. Uh, when he called these, uh, this guy uh, a pump and used the word uh, before that. 
And he was saying, and those words were used by that person sitting at that table. And just trying to inflame the jury at the very outset. And what Don West did when he came behind him, he knew that these guys were it's like the O.J. Simpson, Simpson uh, uh, trial. If, if, if the glove doesn't fit, you must acquit. All this emotion and no evidence. So he was trying to get the jury just to calm back down and remind them of why they were sitting there because they had, in fact, come through the process of, of preemption and they had passed that test of being impartial. He's trying to remind them of their impartiality. And that's why he said what he said, which he said at the end of the, of the trial, he still thought, thought that joke was, was, was uh, funny and I think it was still appropriate because I knew what he was doing when he, when he said it. What he said was, not, he did a knock-knock joke. He said, knock-knock. Who's there? George Zimmerman. George Zimmerman who? And he said, okay, you're on the jury. That's what he was talking about. He was, he was actually in a very uh, subtle way, covertly, reminding those jurors of why you're sitting here and not those other four jurors who could have said at the trial because they, they were alternates because the men get sick and can't fulfill their job or they disqualified at some point because something they do later on, like listen to the evidence, having contact with someone outside of the jury and talking to each other, they could put them off and bring the alternative in. But while they had ten people, six of them serving and four alternates, is because they come through that litmus test of being peers but not being prejudiced. And uh, they had passed the smell test. And that's what he was doing. It was, it was brilliant. But he's not, you know... Uh, he's not Don Rickles, and he's not um, one of the best that's out there, Jay Leno. And, he, and it, it was a joke, a, a good joke told badly. But in terms of being appropriate, I knew exactly what he was doing. It was very appropriate. Because those guys, John Guy, you all were trying to inflame the jury, so he would dismiss the evidence. Because it was that guy who used those words. <laughs> they were trying to break, because they, no, they had no case, and they had to go with emotion. Because they were trying to get the emotion to substitute for the lack of evidence in the, in the case. And it did not work. Uh, back to you, Robin. I haven't forgotten about you. You know, you're up there uh, at CBS. And let me just tell you what you were doing. Because uh, I got, you know, nobody's ever said, nobody said this. See, on my, on my Facebook wall, I'm saying things that nobody else is saying. And so this is what Robin Gibbons did. After Juror uh, B29 uh, in this bingo game, who came in after uh, Juror uh, B37, after she uh, got through with the interview and the juror saying, oh, was me, um, I wanna, uh, we didn't convict him of secondary murder, I held out as long as I could, um, and I was trying to get a hung jury at the end, I was, it was five to one, and they kept talking about, the, what she was really saying, is they kept talking about the evidence in the case, and they kept bringing back the evidence, she's talking about the prejudice, and they talked about the evidence in the case, and they finally brought her around when they had a 6-0 verdict. That's why she said, that's why she said, and let me read this to you again where you won't forget. She said, uh, I was the juror that was going to give them a hung jury, she said. I fought to the end. Fought to the end based upon what? It wasn't uh, based on the evidence. When she got to the evidence, she finally caved in. They kept bringing her back to the evidence. Even I can see that. So um, he, at the end of the interview, here's what Robin, here's what Robin, Robin Roberts did. It was, it was, it was really... Hilarious, which nobody else has seen. But you hear hear at Flint Talk Radio for the first time. She asked uh, the jury number fifth, uh, uh, B uh, uh, twenty nine. She said, "What would you then want to say to the Martin family?" The assumption that Robin Roberts, who was acting like Robin Givens, was uh, assuming is that based upon her uh, not holding out and her comment that George Zimmerman got away with murder but you can't get away from God that the woman was saying that the evidence would have pointed to the guilt of George Zimmerman and the verdict was in fact wrong which is not what she was saying but Gibbons going to ask her at the end John she said what would you then say to the parents of of, of uh, Martin uh, Trayvon Martin uh, at this point in time and this uh, juror who uh, needs to go back to um, a school, the school of logic. I don't know if she took in the class in logic. <clears throat> um, and uh, needs to go go there and, and take well, at least one class. Said I would say that uh, I would like to apologize for letting the uh, parents down. Well, I tell you, I tell you this, Robin, and also the juror. First of all, you, Robin, you you asked the wrong question. The question that you should have asked 
is what would you say? And I'm talking about to juror number B29. You should have asked uh, the, the juror, what would you say to George Zimmerman, who, parents, whose son you tried to frame? Because that's what you really owe an apology for. You don't owe an apology to the Martin family for finding that there was no fault in terms of the uh, uh, the man defending his own life. Now, Trayvon was what, how old, 17? 17. Okay, and what time this happened? Pretty late at night, right? It was, it, it was dark at night, around uh, 7 o'clock, in the 7 o'clock range. Very dark out there mm -hmm. at that time in, in Florida. I heard he was dead for a day or so before his parents found out he was dead. He was. He, in the, he was in the morgue. They were, they, were, they were arrived on the scene within a minute of the actual shooting of Trayvon Martin. But in terms of the notification of the parents, they didn't know who this kid was. You know, he, he didn't have any ID on him, for one thing. And he was living with, um, and if he did have ID on him, he was living at that time uh, not with the parents of note, uh, that, you know, where he, he'd been sent to his father's place, father's staying with his girlfriend, and uh, because he'd been kicked out of school for 10 days, and he had been there only seven days. They had no way of knowing that that would be the house that he was in, because it wasn't in his father's name, and... Uh, and, and so it wasn't like Trayvon Martin and then his father Tracy Martin and there's the house. They had no way of knowing that. So he said the morgue for about two two days without any notification of, of, of who he was and uh, and his location. There's no conspiracy there, just that they didn't have the information to uh, no, no, I, to, I, to process. I'm just wondering with the parents. I mean, I've never been a parent, but I was a probation caseworker. You know what? I think one of my kids came up missing. My par their parents called me within, say, six hours of saying the kid didn't come home when they thought. We'd have been on the phone to the hospitals, the cops, to the morgue. We hope with, of course, we were hoping that was not the case. We'd have been all over that thing. I mean, I agree. And, and so, I mean, two days, and they didn't know where this kid was at. I agree, and it tells us a lot about this fabrication of who this person was. <clears throat> because what that says there is that they didn't see anything unusual about this person being uh, out of there. And, um, and not at home. I mean, that tells me a lot right there. And if you understand the records that were sealed and why they were sealed and what those records contain, and also how the defense did everything they could to keep the character question out of the courtroom, then you understand why that makes uh, sense that they did not know and had no um, contact with the police asking for uh, an um, all-out alert about, their, uh, missing, about his missing son. Which the, which the mom didn't even know that he was missing, and they weren't, the ones that did know, weren't trying to find out where he was. There was no uh, police alert or any of that, no contact with the police department. And the parents didn't make any kind of call in to the cops at all? None at all. So and for two days, this kid sat in the morgue, was it laying in the morgue? That's exactly right. This, okay, so that shows to me a very lackadaisical attitude towards parenting. And also a, a knowledge, a, a prescient knowledge of who Trayvon Martin was, which has nothing to do with the fabrication they have in the media. So I know I know the other side of it also, and I watched um, the um, the testimony of um, of Sabrina Fulton, which they didn't probe into that. It has a name, has a family name, and didn't have the name of anyone that she was supposedly married to. It wasn't carrying Martin's name. It wasn't carrying uh, the other name. She's supposed to have been married. Her uh, her older son is, is named Fulton. So that tells me a lot. Her older son is uh, is, is named Javaris uh, Fulton. Her name is Sabrina Fulton, and her other her younger son is named Trayvon Martin. Can we try to get some understanding of of any of this? But they kept the character question of this family uh, down, and they knew if they brought in the character question, open that door up to the defense. A lot of things are going to come out that they didn't want to come out about this kid. But we, but there are some things we can imply and infer by the fact that this person is missing for two days and that was not seen as uh, being out of character. Because I, I know what I would do and I know what you said you'd do, John. And that is if you had someone missing your family and the person was supposed to be there at a certain time and they're not there, you're not waiting no two days, you're not even waiting a, 
uh, uh, two hours if they if you know the time period in which they're supposed to come back. Right. See, I know you can't file a missing child person report. Now, child, uh, juveniles, it's expedited. I mean, now if an adult was like 20 some years old, 30 some years old, you'd have to have so many days lapse before you could file a missing persons report with the local police usually. But with somebody this young, 17 years old, plus with the chance, my own feeling is if I had a kid I knew was in trouble, and I acknowledge it's a possibility <coughs> my own kid could be a problem, get, become a problem kid. Mm -hmm. I think that's a possibility for everybody. I'm not pointing fingers, but for a two-day lapse, they don't know where the hell this kid's at. I think that's a very good indictment against their parenting skills and their lack of involvement. I think it's 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 um it's it's, it's that, and it's also a statement about uh, what we have sealed in those records. Although we do have some of the evidence that that is not sealed about what it, what it is we're dealing with here. And uh, I don't want to talk about the deceased, but I do want to tell the truth, and that is that this kid was a was on a pathway to uh, a different. Place than his brother Javaris, who will be a senior in college during the uh, fall term starting in September. This is not where Trayvon was going at the time of his death. It does not, does not mean, however, that he could not have gotten there at some point. But that's not the path he was on that night of February 26, 2012. And we might as well stop lying about it and fabricating all, all of these stories. <clears throat> but uh, we owe, we, if, if anybody is owed an, uh, an apology uh, by a uh, juror uh, B. Uh, um, uh, um, uh, uh, 30, uh, 29, it, it belongs to this family that had tremendous integrity, and that was the Joy Zimmerman family. I mean, I just could not believe how much integrity I saw in the one case, and I didn't see the integrity in Sabrina Fulton's case. I know it's, I know it's what the media is saying, but I watched the testimony when they asked her whose voice was on that uh, 911 tape, and when she very coldly said, uh, that's... Um, Trayvon's voice on that tape and said it dispassionately while listening to what would then have had to have been the last cries of her son before he was killed and she said it so dispassionately uh, that became very interesting and it was riveting to her testimony by the mere fact that I haven't seen parents can be that dispassionate listening to the voice of their of their child and of course I never believed that was their child's voice in the first place because I don't know the reason why he would have any, I don't know the reason he'd be calling out for help. <clears throat> because if you know the evidence in this case, there was not one mark on Trayvon Martin's body except that gun, that gunshot wound, which was to his, uh, in, in his chest, right to the, um, on the uh, right side of his heart that uh, punctured the uh, sac going into the uh, right uh, ventricle, the left ventricle over to the right side of his uh, his body, that that was um, the only injury on on Trayvon Martin. When you look at the multiple injuries injuries on Joy Zimmerman, it makes no sense to claim that we don't know who was on that tape screaming for help because Martin didn't need, need any help. But you know, it's a to me it basically boils down to the fact that somebody's got to be apologetic that they lived a, through attack and the other person had to die because they were being attacked and this other person was supposed to go maybe forfeit everything in their life because they were a victim of an attack. I don't care if I, hey, I've been I've been followed by cops before walking the streets. I've had cops go off on me before. I've had them threaten me before. But you know what? I wasn't stupid enough to try to attack them. Mm -hmm. I've had people give me stuff before. Right? I mean, I want, I used to walk the streets quite a bit at night, and, you know, walking around and stuff like that. I had a lot of run-ins with cops, okay? And those were the ones that I had dealings with. But another thing is I've had people come up alongside of me and ask where I was doing in an area because I was walking. They didn't work. I didn't get belligerent with them. They didn't come out and follow me, but if they had, I certainly wouldn't attack them. Okay? <laughs> and that seems like he did that. He seems, from evidence, he attacked uh, George Zimmerman. Yeah, he did. Yeah. Uh, there, there are different ways. That's what Bachler was talking about, by the way. That's why I have so much respect for him in this case. You see, I, I've, I've seen situations like that also, John. I, was, I remember one, I was at uh, one of the uh, restaurants, and I went to uh, get uh, some more pop. And I arrived at the same time that one of the police officers, there were two police officers in this restaurant, and one of them arrived at the pop machine at the same time. And you could feel the tension that was there between the officer and myself. And I think he was actually thinking that I'm just another person who's going to make an indictment because he's a police officer in uniform. And you know what I did? I, um, I said, how are you, sir? And when I did that, the tension went away just immediately, and that guy could not stop talking to me. <laughs> I mean, that's something you can do also. You can engage a conversation to find out what this is about, but you don't haul off 
and do what Trayvon Martin did, and it's very clear what he did. He hauled off and busted the guy in the nose and, and either broke his nose or fractured his nose. There are different reports about what the, the injury that he sustained. But in terms of looking at the evidence before they cleaned it up and before the next day, whatever way they did, the photographic uh, evidence, they tried to say he didn't suffer these injuries. Uh, it's clear that his nose was either fractured or broken, and that came from what they did in the reenactment. Which was he, he carried, he, he, there was a rather than engaging um, a conversation about what this meant, uh, Trayvon Martin hauled off and gave him a left hook. The, you, well, look at you had morons like um, Jennifer Granholm walking around wearing a hoodie in her show. I have no respect for her. I mean, I, she, I had not at all, but when, I mean, I had a potential for it and up to that point. She didn't know the facts of the case of any more than anybody no. else did. And she was going around saying he was only attacked because he was wearing a hoodie. Yeah. That's a lot of crap. Well, let me say this about you hoodie wears and uh, that where you have these signs up saying, I am Trayvon Martin. Well, you know what? Uh, I, I will agree with you up to a point if you mean by that that you are a target. But I want you to understand the other side of it. You're also, Tra you're also George Zimmerman. So you haven't seen that part. You have not dealt with that. But if you look at the statistics where you've had, let me make sure I can quote this correctly. During the time period we've had these 18 months of the Trayvon Martin case, we've had 10,826 blacks that were, that were killed in this country, 95% of whom have been killed by other blacks. So to say that you're Trayvon Martin may well be something you can claim if you're saying that you are in fact being targeted, but do not understand, but understand that you're also George Zimmerman. I don't mean the one down in Florida. I'm talking about the, Zim, the George Zimmerman who, who you claim act that way on the 26th of February, who are acting that way in your community. And they're not doing it out of self-defense. They're doing it just because the community is out of control. And that brings me to the last thing I want to talk about in this case right here. And I'm going to talk next week about uh, this um, ridiculous Attorney General, uh, Eric Holder. We've got to have a conversation about him, too, because we got to talk about the civil rights uh, law. And I was going to uh, get around to that and bring that in and then use... Um, page 150 and 151. I'm going to give you a homework assignment here. Uh, in the book written by Ann Coulter called Demonic. And don't forget to read the other book, the latest book out called Mug, <clears throat> uh, The Demagoguery from the 1970s up to the time of Obama. <clears throat> because Ann Coulter is writing some things and, and some, her insights are some that nobody, I like to, I like to think of that nobody else is, is, uh, is writing about. We, we all have a, a, a shared understanding of things. And so I don't learn anything from them because I kind of have that. The shared understands what we all kind of, you know, have digested. Give me the person to think out of the box. And she does a lot of that. And she did it in Demonic and also her last book called Muck. She does that as well. And uh, I want to do some thinking out of the box outside of what everybody is saying about this attorney general. But I'm going to get into that next week uh, as our main subject. If nothing else comes about, about Trayvon Martin. But as long as it comes up, uh, I'm going to be at the studio discussing it because we've got to first of all put that, that baby to bed. Before we can move on, we can't let them keep bringing things up and then not have as a part of the public conversation because we can't let these guys get the last word in these uh, fabricated uh, uh, stories that that uh, they're telling. Uh, I want I want to end with um, with uh, let, let me end with Bill O'Reilly because we're running out of time here, and I wanted to end with uh, a couple of things. But let me end with Bill O'Reilly because uh, Bill O'Reilly has done something that's very very important in terms of using the Trayvon Martin case to shift the conversation uh, from the paradigm of war is me, look how they're victimizing blacks, and we're back in 1913 where the Klan is still riding, and George Zimmerman's part of the, of the Klan, and look what he did, he's a racist. He racially profiled um, uh, Trayvon Martin, which I contend is a mil another misconception because you can't racially profile. There's no profile that fits a race. And if it is a, a, a profile, if it's an entire race, what's the profile? And, and tell me how that fits into Clarence Thomas. Unless you're going to tell me that Clarence Thomas is not part of the, that he's not black. <laughs> Which is how you get around that nonsense that you're talking about. Because nobody wants to, in fact, uh, deal with all these things that you're talking about, which makes no sense when it's interrogated. But uh, anyway, getting past that to the O'Reilly thing, the reason why O'Reilly, who told the absolute truth in this case, and I, uh, I give a, a, a lot of uh, credit to, to Bill O'Reilly for having the courage to raise the question of these uh, imposters he, he talked about, mentioning names, Al Shout and Jesse Jackson. He didn't call Ben Jealous out because he's a, more of a, a bit player than the big two. 
But if you go to the big three and uh, and, and and bring in that that person, that's being jealous of the NWCP. And he's been just as bad as uh, Shopton and Jesse Jackson have been. In some ways, making more outlandish comments, but not quite as often because he's not as much in the limelight as these two. But none of them have, have uh, shined like, uh, like a star. Um, and so Bill O'Reilly brought it back to why aren't these rights leaders as interested in the 10,826 other cases as they are in terms of the one case that been off 18 months? And they couldn't leave it, by the way, because if they, if they left that case, you know what would have happened? They really would not have had anything else to go to, which is why they stayed on this case, because of the lack of the pervasiveness of racism in America. I'm not saying it's absent, but the place that you're looking for it in, the stats don't support that observation that you claim that you're making. It does exist, but Barclay said something that's very key, and that is that they're black racists too. And I'm going to be writing in my article. I'm going to be challenging this this uh, uh, this nation and the, and the readers of, of my the few readers of my post to reevaluate race in America through the lens of 2013, not through the lens of uh, uh, Mark Lamont uh, Hill, uh, who's another airhead out there, and Cornell West, and all these pundits out here who who are just talking what they call smack. These people don't know what they're talking about. I was I was listening to. Uh, Jame, Jamu Green, who's debating Larry Elder, and she was going to make everybody, uh, uh, indict everybody for the breakdown of order in the uh, black community. They just can't seem to get a sentence out without saying, oh, it's everybody's responsibility. No, it ain't everybody's responsibility. If you have a child and you walk away from raising that child and won't get married to the, to the mother of your child, that ain't my fault. That's your fault for doing that. That ain't everybody's fault. And everybody can't solve that, that problem. The ones that's actually involved in the activities got to, got to uh, solve that problem. We can talk about it. But the persons actually involved in the, in the violation, of the, those are the ones that got to fix the problem. And we got to call them to do that. And we can't do it by talking about over here where the problem doesn't exist. George Zimmerman is white and he was racial profiling. Uh, Trayvon Mod, there's no racial profiling in this case. It's all, that's all a fabrication by, by the uh, media. But what is uh, Bill O'Reilly's uh, uh, heresy? And here is the heresy that Bill O'Reilly uh, did and why Al Sharpton and others are mad at him and are trying to quiet him down as they did uh, um, uh, uh, Bill Cosby inside of the family, you see. But Bill Cosby is outside and they're trying to quiet him down for a different reason. And that's because of his, his heresy. And what is his heresy? His heresy is that he refused to accept and let them place upon him white guilt. That's his heresy. They were refusing to accept that this is an example of white racism and white supremacy operating in a non-white person. That's a ludicrous uh, um, assumption. I don't know if he would have taken on the things he took on if the person had been white. But George Zimmerman is not white. George Zimmerman was made white by the, by the uh, liberal uh, media. They fabricated that story. You look at this guy's uh, father. His father's not white, and his mother, who is from Peru, is uh, very Hispanic. His dad is less so, but they thought because the name was Zimmerman, they're talking about a Jewish person, and they're going to run with that narrative, which is false. Uh, this was um, uh, a Hispanic you know, family, and the dad said real clearly and almost as soon as they were putting forth this narrative, this was white. He said, my son is Hispanic. And if you looked at the family, you saw that. So Bill O'Reilly refused to take that baggage and repudiated the white guilt. And they wanted to shut him up. And that's why they mad at him, not because he's not telling the truth. Okay, we got to get out of here. But next week, stay with us. We'll be talking about, I promise we're going to talk about Eric Holder. Because we've got to have that conversation as well. Until, until next time, we want you to follow your dream. Because if you don't follow your dream, you'll never know what's on the side of the rainbow.